us today to rededicate the Peace Pool with, a, with us here at Bristol. A little bit of background on our Peace Pool. Our Peace Pool was installed here about 10 years ago by our former student senate. And every year since, we've made the effort to rededicate it every year. Um, we usually pick a theme, and this year I haven't chosen a theme. I've just chosen um, to rededicate it to everybody who's suffering from some form of violence or has been killed by violence to date. Peace. The very word peace is defined in a dictionary as freedom from disturbance, tranquility. An alternate definition for peace is a state or period in which there is no war or war has ended. On Saturday, we once again celebrated the International Day of Peace, and yet we are reminded that our country is still at war since the awful and unimaginable tragedies of 9-11. We remember that to date, as of August 31st, 2019, 297 mass shootings have occurred. This averages 1.2 mass shootings per day. In these shootings, 1,219 people were injured and 335 have died for a total of 1,554 victims. We remember that in 2018, advocates tracked at least 26 deaths of transgender people in the, in the United States due to fatal violence, the majority of whom were black transgender women. These victims were killed by acquaintances, partners, strangers, some of whom have been arrested and charged while others have yet to be identified. Sadly, 2019 has already seen at least 19 transgender people fatally shot or killed by other violent means. We remember that while we realize terrorist attacks have gone down worldwide, we still have lost approximately 18,753 people at the hands of violence to date. We remember that 33 unarmed people have been shot and killed by the police this year. We remember that on a typical day, there are more than 20,000 phone calls placed to domestic violence hotlines nationwide. We remember that on average, nearly 20 people for a minute are physically abused by an intimate partner in the United States. This equates to more than 10 million women and men. Intimate partner violence accounts for 15% of all violent crime. One in three murder victims are female and one in 20 are male. One in five students ages 12 to 18 have been bullied during the school year. 160,000 teens have skipped school due to bullying. More than half of bullying situations, 57%, stop when a peer intervenes on behalf of the student being bullied. I have reflected the past few days on peace and what some of the late great leaders of our country have said about peace. JFK, Gandhi, Mother Teresa. And I came across a speech from the late Charlie Chaplin, an accomplished filmmaker, actor, composer. Then, in the name of democracy, let us use that power. Let us all unite. Let us fight for a new world, a decent world, that will give man a chance to work, that will give youth a future, and old age a security. By the promise of these things, brutes have risen to power, but they lie. They do not fulfill that promise. They never will. Dictators free themselves, but they enslave the people. Now let us fight to fulfill that promise. Let us fight to free the world, to do away with national barriers, to do away with greed. Let us fight for a world of reason, a world where science and progress will lead to all men's happiness. Soldiers, in the name of democracy, let us all unite. I'm now going to call up to the podium Vice President of Student Services, Vice, uh, Vice President Ed Cabellan. Good afternoon, everyone. As Amy said, my name is Ed Cabellan. My pronouns are he, his, him, and I am the Vice President for Student Services here at Bristol. Thank you so much uh, for coming here today to be part of our Call to Peace event. I'd like to thank Amy Blanchett and our student and family engagement team for their efforts and for the invitation to kick off our festivities today. Today's event and what it symbolizes is so important given the state of our world today. In a time of visible and invisible civil unrest, injustice and hate, Bristol Community College's faculty, staff and students must now look in the mirror and ask, who are we now? Who do we want to be in the future? And how do we achieve peace as part of our identity? To the question of who are we now, after my first year at Bristol, I believe, generally speaking, that we are a caring and thoughtful community. We care deeply 
for and support our students and one another. I've seen this at all four of our Bristol locations, both in and out of the classroom. To the question of who, we, who do we want to be in the future, we want to be a Bristol that not only continues to be already who we are, but also increase our capacity for inclusion through inclusionary practices that acknowledges and celebrates our rich, diverse population. Small actions, such as sharing one's pronouns or using microphones in large spaces during events are just two meaningful ways to continue building a peaceful and inclusionary campus. Finally, to the question of how do we achieve peace as part of our identity, this is rooted in our daily actions with one another, especially in how we treat one another. I believe that as a public educational institution, we have an obligation to treat all with respect and with dignity. Part of these actions include asking good questions of one another, listening intently, and disagreeing with civility. Civil rights leader Mahatma Gandhi was famously quoted by saying, quote, be the change that you wish to see in the world, unquote. And while I agree with that sentiment, I will augment this quote with one from Star Wars, from Jedi Master Yoda, who said, do or do not, there is no try. We must act and do peacefully if we are to achieve the peace we want for Bristol, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, for the United States of America, and for the world. Thank you for being here today and being part of that change. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cabellan. I'd now like to call up staff member, student and family engagement, Maurice Sear. Thank you all for coming out today. Um, this is an important day because this peace poll is a symbol for Bristol and the rest of our country. So Amy defined peace, um, and I found a little bit of a different definition, um, but similar. Um, so what is peace? Um, it's defined as freedom from civil disturbance or a state or period in which there is no war. It's not tangible. It's a concept. It's a state of being. Today we stand here to rededicate this peace poll located on our college campus. I cannot think of a better location for a peace poll than an institution of learning. Albert Einstein once said, peace cannot be kept by force. It can only be achieved by understanding. In order for peace to exist, humanity must learn to coexist. We must learn how others live, love, and worship. We must learn to respect our differences instead of allowing these differences to divide humanity. Here at Bristol, as well as other schools and college campuses all over the world, students study history. They learn about the costs humanity incurs when there is no peace. As members of this institution of higher learning, we must all strive to instill in all who come to our campus a sense of respect, individuality, and acceptance for all. We must strive for peaceful coexistence. We must celebrate our cultural differences and not allow these differences to divide us. When we do, we honor the message of the Peace Poll. And every time we expand our minds to learn something about a different culture, we honor the, this rededication ceremony. Thank you. Thank you, Maurice. I'm not going to call up. Tracy Fratago Chagas, who is the advisor of the Hawk newspaper and an instructor here on campus. <laughs> Hi, class. <laughs> Thank you, Amy, so much for including me in this event. As a director of a community organization in New Bedford, where 70% of our students aged 12 through 18 report being exposed to violence in their homes and their neighborhoods every day. I think of the importance of creating a peaceful society where we live in peace and harmony and safe in our homes and our environments. 
At Bristol, we are all committed to promoting peace in our daily lives. As we commit to changing lives learner by learner, I would like to share some tips that I've discovered on how education promotes peace in society. These tips were found from the Central Asia Institute entitled Education for Peace, the top 10 ways education promotes peace. And I want these tips to remind you all of the ways we are making a difference here educators, administrators, and students. Education boosts confidence and hope. Education promotes independent thinking, inspires problem-solving skills, builds communication skills. Education opens doors, reduces poverty, increases political involvement, reduces support of terrorism. Education builds empathy and tolerance and cultivates respect. Let's all commit to listening longer, reacting less, and always to be a resource to develop peaceful relationships and solutions. As I stand before you, I ask you to let peace begin with you. And I want to tell one short story of how peace and the importance of cultivating peace in this community became more real and necessary in my life. In 2006, working with youth in the community on a Songs of Hope initiative, working with youth who were gang prone, after seeing them develop songs and poems and working hard to change their own minds to inspire others, to help to solve some of the issues in their own neighborhoods and homes. We had a four hour show where these youth had a thousand people in attendance, many from competing gangs, which was a huge, huge success for them. And these youth listened to individual solutions made by people in their neighborhoods. Instead of being able to celebrate the success of their initiative, instead of being outside with a reporter, being able to talk about all the hours of work they put into their work and practicing, and the amazing success of having people from different conflicting gangs and their families there to support them. I had to be talking about how a stabbing happened just outside after their event. Now this stabbing was reported not to have anything to do with the concert, but it was very clear to me in that moment how necessary it is that we understand and we commit to the violence around us and to the change that we will continue to make. At Bristol, we are so far ahead of the game because we are all committed to educating each other. So please, I ask you to be committed to keep showing up, to be committed to always listen, to react less, and to always be supportive in our Bristol community because we can make great change in our homes, in our neighborhoods, in our community, and the world. And thank you, Amy, and student life and family engagement for providing this opportunity, and for me also to remember how important cultivating peace is. Thank you, Tracy. Our next speaker, I'm gonna bring up Mr. Rob Delalu, director of our Multicultural Center here. Hello, everyone. Um, what is peace? All week, um, I asked myself that very question, although it, you know, I just was told that it shouldn't be hard to speak about peace. 
Um, but it is. Uh, when you, you know, when you sit there and you, you think about your life and what you've been through and your, per, your different perspectives and what you've grown up around or what you've seen, as Ms. Fortado just talked about, those instances are very uh, real. Um, from days of, you know, being a teenager and growing up with any, not much, not coming from privilege, those things resonate with myself and many of the students that we have here at Bristol. I know many of us have nights where we are hungry, nights where we feel frustrated, nights where we look at others and we question who they are, question where they come from. We question why do we feel the way we feel at times? Um, why do we have these emotions or, you know, why do we judge, you know, or think about the person who might have a different political view or may have, you know, a different mindset than you may have. And that's what the beauty of being in college is. Today I was asked to speak about, you know, supremacy and the ideals of how cultural oppression and how it leads to issues like systemic racism, police brutality, gentrification, and much, much more. Although important to me and to many of my students, um, I don't want to speak about that today. I don't want to speak about how one group or one person is responsible for our country's demise or even point, uh, point to those who we feel should live in guilt because of their privilege or endless opportunities for success. To me, we live in a world where blaming and finger pointing runs rampant, yet in, yet in doing so, we want those who we blame and point at not to be in the defensive. Is our peace only liberated to get what we want or feel that in which we deserve. I could agree that we all deserve to live harmoniously and free, but how do we get to that point? How do we change minds that do not want to be changed? Why do we fight the same fight day after day, month after month, year after year, and somehow are shocked by the result that people are not on board or why people still hate? Is world peace a fantasy and not something that can be a reality? Are we simply fighting a war that we cannot win? So today I ask for us to, to, think, about, to think about that when we, when, we lit, when we reflect on this day, and do we have inner peace? See, inner peace to me is serving up love with, with self first. A lot of us do not love ourselves Therefore, we can't give peace and love others. You must look at yourself and love the person you are, but that person must understand that in doing so, it will come with a greater purpose. Sometimes it's a burden, like I'm having this week when I thought about this question. I always think about giving love and protecting others, sometimes before protecting myself, and sometimes even checking to see if I really truly love or have inner peace within myself. If you feel oppressed or marginalized by others and allow it to weigh, weigh you down, are you at peace? If you are passionate and angered about something, are you spreading peace to others or are you causing more harm than good? I just asked a ton of questions and I have no proof that this will even work or make sense that I want us all to reflect. But what I do feel is that, we, that the world we live in lives inside of us and however we create it to be. We are, we are only open to what we allow ourselves to be open to and what we want to know. So get to know those who are to your left and to your right, front, back, who look different than you, male, female, black, white. It doesn't matter. Get to know those individuals before you pass judgment. Political, you know, right now we live in a, in a political world that is, there's a lot of difference and a lot of hate but understand each other. Understand the differences, and someone may have privilege, that's okay. As a male, I have privilege. I don't just think about the privilege that somebody may have over me because of the color of their skin. Think about those things, love each other, live in peace. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Before I call the next speakers to the podium, we have some people here in attendance that I just want to recognize. I would like to recognize current city councilor, Derek Riveris, who's Actually, here's his, in his position as the athletic director today. 
candidate for mayor Paul Coogan for and current city um, school committee member, sorry. State Representative Carol Fiola, State Representative Alan Sylvia. Thank you for attending. We appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here. I'm gonna introduce the next speaker, who is our student trustee, CJ Souza. I'm a man built by my own merit, but I live a life where I'm judged by my body and my place within society. When I was 12 years old, I had a big realization that should have left me feeling at home and at peace, and more so than I'd ever had before. However, on that day, I can remember being filled with more terror and apprehension than I'd ever felt before, instead of the gratitude and relief that I should have felt. I came out as transgender at the age of 12 to a handful of close friends. I didn't tell my mother for several years, despite her understanding and loving nature. My mother's amazing. I didn't tell her because I was afraid. Despite knowing with every fiber of my being that she would love me and accept me for who I was because I was afraid that she would find the same fear in her heart that I found. I was afraid of the world, not of my realization. I was afraid because I knew no one would ever look at me the same way again. And I was right to be afraid. Over the next few years of my life, it would change drastically. And I was too young to imagine the ways that would happen. I would lose friends and family, all from a piece of me that couldn't be ignored anymore. I was tormented endlessly during my time in middle and high school. My difference was too noticeable, too apparent. I was too trans. And even though I'm comfortable with myself now, I know that there are people around me who aren't. When someone challenges my transness and makes me feel less than human, that's my fault. I was too trans, too visible, too challenging. It's like my transness is a dirty secret that I have to keep from the world and nobody wants to know. And the fact that I treat it like common knowledge makes people's skin crawl. Though all of that led me to a realization that is greater than anything I could have imagined. It took me a long time to realize that that struggle was my peace. My heart and my mind were at rest despite the chaos around me and the conflict I had with others. I was genuine, I was me, painfully, aggressively, queerly myself. And there's an unmistakable peace that comes from establishing yourself as who you are and never letting anyone back you into a corner. Never letting anyone try to convince you that you are who you're not. Peace may mean many different things to each and every one of us here, but peace to me always means the freedom from the confines that other people trap me within. Thank you. Thank you, CJ. I'm now going to call up speaker number six, director of the Women's Center, Eva Brito. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me at this wonderful ceremony in honor of peace. This um, ceremony touches home for me because the first time that we actually had this ceremony, um, prior to my role as the director of the Women's Center, I was the director of the Gateway to College program. And um, in that program, we had lost someone to violence in Fall River. And this ceremony was held a few months after that, in which we invited the individual's family to come and so forth. So it really was a call to reality of how important peace needs to be, not only around the world, but in our community. And that's, you know, part of our mission at the Women's Center is having a place of inclusivity and a place that says regardless of how you identify, how you see yourself in this world, you're welcomed. And I think we need more of that because before I am a feminist, I'm a humanist, that regardless, we are all humans and need to look at unity as one of our greatest strengths moving forward. So what I decided to do for my brief um, presentation was to just share a poem that came out of wanting for peace, um, really feeling, as we all feel many times, exhausted 
by some of the images we see, some of the stories we know, that we've been impacted by the lack of peace and by the lack of love in our world. So one of the many hats I wear is I am an artist and I'm a poet and I wrote a book of poetry and one of the poems, the poem I'm gonna share from you is from my book, Essence, Tones, Whispers and Shouts and the shouts part of the book is poems that talk about activism and talking about the importance of speaking out for issues regarding peace and um, social justice. So again, this poem's called Exhale for Hope, and it speaks to really feeling suffocated at times and wanting that breath of love and hope to be infused in our society and our worlds and everything that comes through us. Mother Earth's piercing cry echoes around the world, shaking our conscious core, future windows shattered, broken family trees, blood-stained roots, vibrating heartache, category 25, violence earthquake, devastating desperation, loss of another son, daughter, ihu, iha, mommy, papi, little brother, sister, tio, tia, auntie, grandma, papa, niece, nana, nephew, friend, amiga, mentor, primo, prima, teacher, neighbor, student, loved one. Open our eyes to this epidemic, church bells ringing, ancestral calling, calling an end to this barbaric civil war, subsiding in our living room. Too close to the screen, a blur, flattening sensitivity, countless faces, TikTok Sanford, TikTok Ferguson, TikTok New York, TikTok Cleveland, TikTok Baltimore, TikTok your block. Overstuffed society drop box ready to pop. A thousand pound life weight, earth felt styes, media lies, broken integrity spine, value and property over lies, illogical loss, tearing away our humanitarian cloth. Each shake, tremor, and sound more urgent than the last, calling on our societal leaders to unpress the privileged mute button and hear reality's truth. Agonizing defeat aftershocks of white supremacy deafening the soul, testing faith of a song, song for way too long, of change gonna come, uncome upon. Looking for a new resolution to baptize our soul, as I can only hold Goliath's chokehold for so long before another explosion that I can't breathe. Asking for another swa another swallow of society's toxins locked in, praying to find and exhale for hope. Thank you. Thank you, that was amazing. All right, we're going to call up our last speaker, and our last speaker is Reverend Jim Hornsby, and he comes to us from St. Luke's Episcopal Church. After Reverend Hornsby is done talking, we're going to do a dove release. The nice thing about coming last is that most of the things I was going to say have already been said. I'm so glad. So I talk a little bit about peace, a practical thing, and then as a follower of Jesus, I'll offer a prayer as we rededicate the peace pole. Peace for me is an active process. It is not something abstract to steal a phrase from the poet. It is a baptism of the soul. So that when we come to our realization that we are human, that we are part of a human race, we can go out and work actively for peace, practicing both in our lives, personally in our families, with our friends, with others whom we disagree. Remembering, when people disagree strongly, 
and perhaps even say vile things. It often comes from areas in which they themselves have been hurt, in which they themselves are insecure. So peace is something that is not, it is a cessation of war, a living in freedom, but more than that, it is a way of totally living, living our lives, and I pray that our country and the countries of the world, all of them, may actively work for peace and resolve conflicts and difficulties and disagreements with peaceful negotiation and peaceful action. And this week I was, I had an eerie memory. I heard on the radio that pre the president had sent troops to Saudi Arabia. Hmm. The memory that flashed back, the memory that flashed back was of President Kennedy when I was in college saying that he'd sent a few advisors to Southeast Asia and Vietnam. Hmm. Let us hope that our current efforts will be peaceful ones in our country. And so we rededicate a peace poll. I offer a prayer. Gracious God, deliver us. Deliver us from the curse of war and the human sin that causes war. From pride that turns its back on you and from unbelief that will not bow. From national vanity that poses as patriotism and from loud mouth boasting and blind self-worship that admits no guilt. From the lust for property of power that drives humanity to kill. From trusting in the weapons of war and mistrusting the counsels of peace. From hearing, believing, and speaking lies about other nations and other religions. from words and deeds that encourage discord, prejudice, hatred, from everything that prevents the human family from fulfilling your promise of peace. Give us your peace, O Lord. We pray for world leaders, ambassadors, diplomats, statesmen, for international federations of labor and industry, for worldwide and local agencies of compassion which bind wounds and feed the hungry. For all who in any way work to further the cause of peace and goodwill. Hasten the day when people shall live together in your love. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever, amen. May this poll be a sign of peace and a sign of our commitment to it as we come and worship and walk and learn in this lovely spot.
Thank you, Reverend Horsby, for that beautiful blessing, and thank you for all the speakers who came out today. I really appreciate it. Bill and Paula are going to come down with the doves, and we're going to do a dove release as the last portion of this program. There's a table up over the stairs where you can create a kindness rock, and those are going to be placed around our peace pole to keep here at the campus as a symbolism of our commitment to peace. Thank you. Do we have any volunteers that want to come and release a dove? Come on, you all know you want to do it. Come down. It's for world peace, guys. I'm really excited about these doves, P.S. To answer a couple questions, the doves uh, don't fly wild. The doves, after they're released, return home safely.